We're going to kick off the technical content for the class by talking about systems, architecture, and structure. This does not have to do with the architecture class that much. It has more to do with how different pieces of software talk to each other and interact on modern systems. Um, you know me. I'm Gabe. I'm teaching this class. Learning operating systems is exercising many of the pieces of your brain that might be worked on by different by other classes, but certainly it zeroes in on a few different types of thinking. So when you take general classes, you might be honing your logical thinking, you might be training in inductive reasoning, so deductive and then inductive. You might be memorizing quite a bit. You might be trying to understand the relationships between different things, which is kind of trying to, to build relationships, hopefully, between things that you understand well and things that you don't. Um, enhancing creative thinking or enhancing critical thinking. Um, you might be able to think of many examples of different classes that do different aspects of a lot of lists. Um, learning a foreign language requires a lot of memorization of vocabulary. Uh, taking biology requires a lot of memorization of a lot of the words, etc. Discrete math requires that you're honing your logical thinking and your inductive reasoning, and then also your critical thinking by deciding how to structure those different facilities together. So the question is, what does operating systems do? So think about it for a little bit, pause, take a time out, think about it. Um, and then think about why that might be. Now, my take on operating systems is that it focuses much more of, on these things, honing logical thinking, so kind of trying to make deductions from how certain parts of the system to the broader system, uh, understanding the relationship between things. This is kind of like part and parcel for what systems is and what a lot of actual programming is, trying to figure out how different aspects of the system can and should relate to each other. And we're going to be working a lot in trying to enhance your critical thinking. However, in this class, there isn't as much creative thinking. You have to go into something like Advanced OS to get that. And uh, most importantly, I really want to emphasize that memorization is something that is not as much of a focus in this class. If you feel like you're memorizing things for the class, then you aren't necessarily building the structures to think about how the different things relate to each other. So let me give some examples about how I think about doing that. So one way to think about this is an analogy, which is kind of atoms versus compounds, so or versus molecules. So atoms are the smallest unit within the system. I know this is completely antiquated, like I'm talking back in the Greeks that atoms were kind of the smallest thing, but okay, bear with me. Um, we think of the atoms as being the atomic elements, the smallest units. We think of modules as being compositions of different atoms together, and sometimes different module molecules together, and we try to do it in systems. Systems. So this is how I want you to think about a lot of this class. We learn the atoms, you learn what the hardware gives us effectively. So the hardware gives us certain facilities that enable us to structure the system in different ways, and we can deduce from the limitations and quirkiness, at the quirky aspects of those hardware features, how we might structure the system. We also try to infer things about performance. If we understand how the atoms perform or how they are slow, we can infer things about molecules. When we put those things together, how do they behave? Well, they're a composition of their atoms, therefore, in some sense, you can sum up the atoms and get a rough cut of performance. So the molecules build up to the full systems that we use today. So the whole idea is that I really hope that by the end of the class you'll have some sense about going from the atoms that the hardware gives us all the way up to the systems that we have now and kind of understand the logic and the reasoning that got us to where we are today and how we structure systems. There are many OS atoms. I'll give some examples here. You might not recognize all of these, but I want to list them for, compl for uh, completeness here anyway. Um, some of the atoms given to us by the hardware include things like registers and stacks, the foundations for a lot of control flow and um, uh, computation. Dual mode execution, which we'll talk about today. System calls, much the same. Interrupts, that we'll talk about next lecture. Um, input output direct memory access and IO in, uh, interaction instructions. These all have very particular properties and are used in very specific ways and we try to construct things like networking stacks and file systems out of them. 
exceptions, page tables and virtual address spaces, which are the foundation for application to application isolation, translation look aside buffers, cache lines, atomic instructions galore. There are a lot of atoms, but I hope that a lot of the memorization aspects in the class are focused around really understanding what these things are and why they are the way that they are and in trying trying to figure out from there how everything else is structured so we are going to focus a lot on learning the atoms what they are how they work and what their performance properties are then we're going to focus on how the atoms can be used together so a lot of the questions that you're getting alongside these lectures are going to be focusing on that and all of the projects are going to be focusing on how you can take the atoms and put them together in more interesting molecules so how does critical thinking fit into this so critical thinking is um, triggered when we kind of ask questions like what atoms are involved in certain operations? What, were, what are the trade-offs there? What atoms could be involved but maybe not be? And what atoms should be involved? Different atoms provide different um, properties in terms of things like safety but also in terms of performance and often there are trade-off between things like safety and performance. So given a certain goal that a system might have, which atom should you use? This is the type of critical thinking that we use to decompose a system and try to design, try to figure out what a good design of it will be. So the logical reasoning then is just how do we make these atoms interact to generate a molecule's behavior. Again, building up to real systems that you're actually probably watching this video on. And finally, how do we understand our relationships between different aspects of the system? If we think about a current system as being a collection of molecules, maybe applications, virtual machines, whatnot, how do the atoms interact within each of the modules to give us their performance? And how do those modules compose together to do interesting things? This is all a little abstract, and that's okay. I just want to give you a sense of how we want to think about systems so that we don't focus on memorization and in instead focus on trying to build up systems as the world that our computations exist in based on sound reasoning and trade-offs. Um, I wrote a post a long ago linked to from the syllabus on atoms in operating systems and how to think about some operations as compositions of those. Please read that. Now, last class, we talked about what an operating system is, and we thought of it as a sandwich, right? Just a reminder, of course, very, very important to get this part of a class right. If you walk away with one thing, it's that if operating systems are part of a sandwich, then you have the boring, caloric, horrible bread on top, which are the applications. No, you know, we, we don't like Lowe's. And then you have kind of the boring hardware underneath, the bread, you know, it just weights you down. It's just empty calories. And then you have the interesting filling, the, the, the lettuce, the tomatoes, the meats right in the center, right? So, I mean, this is, of course, um, nobody could argue with this breakdown of a system. So I just want to bring up the, the, the structure again. Now, we have two questions that this kind of way of conceptualizing the system brings up. And these are kind of the, the question mark pointing here. You see the question mark saying, hey, what is that upper interaction between the operating system and the applications? What are the constraints on that? What are the trade-offs that that makes? And then you have the lower question, which is between the hardware, especially I.O. devices, how do they interact with the operating system? If the operating system is there to effectively provide abstractions to the things above, provide resource management for all of the applications trying to uh, access the hardware and trying to, trying to abstract away the intricacies of the hardware. Um, what, do these actual, what do these interactions actually look like? And how might we implement operating systems to make, to optimize for certain constraints? So in this lecture, we're going to focus on this top interaction between applications and the operating system. This is kind of a, a crappy picture stolen from the Silbershatz book. Um, 
where we kind of have the applications, user level stuff, the, the users themselves, GUIs, graphical user interfaces, all of that, above a system call layer that talks to the services of the system. Services are the things that go into our operating system, and all of that's above the hardware. We're just going to dive into the details of what all of this really means. But first, I want to back away from operating systems and I want to build up a few of the atoms that hardwares and compilers give us, which revolve around how um, we just do normal computations for normal C programs in this case, but most languages prescribe to the same types of things. So we see foo and bar, foo being a very simple program that has a couple of local variables, b and c, takes an argument a, and returns c, which is some math on the um, uh, input, right? Then we have bar that calls foo with the argument being 10, right? So what I want you to think about, you're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pause and contemplate these questions is, how does the CPU perform the addition? Like, where are the actual values being computed? Where does the system store B and C, which are the local variables? Local variables is a word, it's an abstraction. Where physically are those local variables being stored? And what about A, where is A being stored? How about the return value, which ends up being C here? Um, where is that stored? So just ask yourself, think a little bit about where all these things are, pause the video. Okay. <clears throat> Let's dive into it a little bit. So the first thing I want you to understand is simply that when we make function calls, we are manipulating an execution stack. I'm gonna be talking a lot about a stack list lecture and perhaps the next. Whenever I talk about the stack, I do not mean like a data structure stack that we're talking that you talk about in 1112 that you know is a contrast to a queue. When I talk about a stack, I mean an architectural stack that tracks the execution throughout a program, okay? So on the left in the blue, you see the registers, um, EIP, EAX, EDX. These are just a nomenclature for 32-bit x86 uh, microarchitecture, um, or for the, the ISA, um, x86-32. Um, EIP stands for the extended IP. Um, EAX stands for basically the A register, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we see the, the registers, then we see the stack in the middle, which is kind of the teal, and it has a few colored regions within it. So what we see at the um, top of the stack, or further towards the stop, is a um, green value for locals. And we see on the right, the bar function that has a local variable. So that is actually where that local is stored. It's stored on the stack in what's called the activation record for bar. While the bar function is executing, then that record exists on the stack. It's used to store the variables for that function on the stack effectively, okay? However, when foo um, calls, when I'm sorry, when bar calls foo, when that line calling foo passing 10 is invoked, what happens is we want to call the foo function. By calling the foo function, what happens is we need to pass the argument to A, which is 10, right? So when we pass 10 into the uh, into foo, what bar does is first it pushes it onto the stack. So you see that light blue value getting pushed onto the stack for A, and it's correspondingly colored that same color in the foo function. And then what bar does is it pushes onto the stack the address directly following where foo is being invoked. So you see the purple on the right matching that purple address is pushed onto the stack. That is effectively the address that foo should return to when it's done computing, okay? And that is just stored on the stack. At that point, we actually jump to the address of foo and start executing the assembly code for foo. And the first thing that we see is that we have two local variables, B and C, and I asked earlier where those are stored, and we see now that those are actually stored on the stack. Again, all local variables for a function are stored on the stack while it's active. 
Um, and we see here that the frame pointer EBP points to the base of the activation record for foo, or the base of really the local variables. Um, and the stack pointer ESP points to effectively the bottom of the stack where um, the uh, foo, foo's data ends. So this is what happens. The stack looks like list colored in this way after we have invoked foo. So it's as if we set a breakpoint in foo and looked at the stack. Okay. So let's walk through that just kind of looking at the assembly a little bit to really see what's happening. So in bar we call foo. So what you see is in bar on the right, we're pushing onto the stack. There's usually an ISA instruction for pushing an argument onto the stack, the A register. Um, the percent sign essentially just means register. So we push onto the stack A. We know that, well, yeah, we push onto the stack A, and we're presuming in this case that EAX holds 10, which you see on the um, left-hand side of the screen. So we're putting 10 onto the stack where I said we would, right? And then we're executing the call instruction to invoke bar. Call does two things. One, it pushes the address of after onto the stack, which you now see um, on the appearing on the stack, and it um, jumps to the code for bar, or for foo, sorry. <laughs> um, and here we see foo. I've kind of expanded out foo into the corresponding assembly for it. I do not expect you to understand all of this. Most of it is just doing the additions by five and um, all of that. You can see kind of two uh, subtract and then two add instructions in there. The two adds are doing the adds that you see in the C code. So what happens here? Well, we've pushed onto the stack the B and C register, um, as we talked about, or not, sorry, I'm sorry. We push onto the stack the B and C local variables, as we talked about before. And this code that we're seeing burst out into the assembly is essentially tracking all of these variables on the stack. So where is B, where is C, and where's the argument? And we can see that there's a lot of math being done um, relative to EBP, the base pointer again, and ESP. Now, a few notes on terminology here. Um, now that you're thoroughly confused by it, let's back up a little bit. If you see a percent sign X where X is anything, then X is a register, right? So again, percent sign EAX is the just uh, referencing the EAX register. The move instruction is kind of a load or a store instruction depending on um, what is being moved to what. So it's a, basically just an instruction for moving from data, data from A to B, where A and B are kind of the arguments of move. And whenever you see the strange syntax where you see X parentheses and then a register, what that's actually saying is that Y holds a pointer to memory. We're going to add X to that pointer and dereference it. So that's the same as essentially saying, all right, if Y is a pointer, it's just a char star, so it's a pointer to something in memory, I'm going to look at the Xth value within that Y array, okay? So this is confusing. Listen to that explanation a couple of times if you don't get it. But long story short here, when we see that first instruction that uses the dereference, it's essentially saying, I want to move from the offset 8 from where EBP is pointing to, um, and I want to move it into the EAX register. We can now see what that's actually doing, right? That's actually taking the argument being passed into the function and accessing that. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. We're going to go into this in actual class. Um, but please read more about this. CDECL is a calling convention. A calling convention is a codification of where arguments and return values should be allocated, where they should be placed, be it in registers or be it on the stack in the example we just gave. Right. I do want to point out here that the return value for foo is actually placed in the EAX register. So whereas all of the arguments are being passed on the stack, the return value uh, 
um, following the CDAC recalling convention is actually returned in a register. So this does a combination of passing some stuff on the stack and some stuff in a register. Now I want to make an aside here because it's kind of hard to see the forest from the trees when you start thinking about this information. So what we're seeing here is that sometimes we're using registers for things, sometimes we're using the stack for things. The portion of the system that actually determines whether something's in a register or whether it's on the stack is the compiler. Now the compiler is probably following some calling conventions when it's generating code, but in essence the compiler is trying to decide where data should be allocated. This is an instance of a general problem we have in operating systems, which we call kind of optimizing for the storage hierarchy. And I'm going to pit, visualize that as this pyramid. At the top, we see registers. They are the smallest, which, you know, they're the smallest box there. Um, but they are the fastest storage to access on our CPU. Then you have L1 cache. Um, I, this is a very embarrassing. And you should, if you ever feel like you have imposter syndrome for anything, just remember this example. Um, it took me about four years of taking operating systems classes, becoming a PhD student, and then even then, took me about four years to understand what the dollar sign meant here, right? So I always saw L1 dollar sign, and I was like, okay, I don't know, strange convention that dollar sign basically means a CPU cache. Um, yeah, that's the cache symbol. So it's L1 cache. Yeah, everybody who I tell the story to actually already knew that. I just am very, very exceptionally slow at some things. Um, but, you know, you spend enough time on something, you get good at it. Um, so L1 cache is a hardware cache that's used to store a small amount of data. It's bigger than registers, but not the biggest. And it's really quick to access. It's usually about like four cycles, three to four cycles to access data in it. But it's relatively small, and if you run out of space in there, then data has to move to the L2 cache, which is just a bigger cache, but slightly slower. Then you go to L3 cache again much bigger, but again, slower. And then we actually have memory. So memory is out there. It can be very large, um, but it is behind these different levels of cache. And then you might have solid state drives, which are relatively fast, but nowhere near as fast as memory. And then at the very lowest level, you have magnetic hard drives, which are exceptionally slow, but exceptionally huge, right? You could expand this even further by talking about tape and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I won't bore you with that. So if we think about this, um, we can think that the registers are very, very fast. Um, every single cycle that a CPU ticks by and performs operations, it can do multiple register operations. So they are faster than a cycle. They're as fast as it gets. But they only store about a kilobyte of data. Um, caches are between, you know, around 4 and 50 cycles to access. And they can hold tens to tens, uh, uh, tens of kilobytes to tens of megabytes. Um, and then you have memory, which is, of course, in the gigabytes or terabytes realm, but it's relatively expensive to access, actually. So a uh, CPU can do 500 operations while you can get one piece of memory, right? Um, so the cache is there to kind of hide that overhead. And we have all of the types of storage that I talked about, and they basically all take you know, basically all of the cycles compared to all of these measurements, but they go into the many, many terabytes of data. And the general goal that we have when designing these systems is that we want access to be as fast as registers, but also as much storage as disk. So you can imagine trying to create this illusion is very difficult. And a lot of what the compiler is trying to do is when it was generating all that assembly that we looked at was try to keep things in registers as much as possible while putting them out onto the stack and into memory only when it absolutely needed to. So the compiler is kind of doing this delicate dance. Now one, just for context, I want to uh, ask the question, you know, what part of, an, uh, of a system, a modern computing system does or manages each of these four different levels of storage? Let you pause and think about that for a second. 
Um, registers are actually, as we kind of saw, managed by the compiler. The compiler decides what should be moved into a register because in the end, it's um, ISA instructions that are doing that. You're either loading things into registers or storing things from register into memory. You might be doing addition on registers, but in the end, the compiler is deciding what variables should go in the register at any point in time. So the compiler generally manages that. Caches are managed by hardware. So L1, L2, L3, the policies for deciding what data is at what level are entirely dictated by kind of pseudo least recently used policies embedded within the hardware, within the circuits of the hardware. The memory itself is actually managed by the operating system. The operating system does things like you'd expect malloc to do, allocating, calling malloc, freeing, allocating and freeing memory, right? And then we have storage, of course, and that's also managed by the operating system. The operating system creates the illusion of file systems, the abstraction of file systems out of kind of just dumb blocks that exist on a storage medium. So the operating system manages all of those. Um, so that's a little bit of an aside where I just wanted to kind of give some perspective on why all that code was so complicated and what the compiler was trying to do there. Backing up a little bit, now we've talked about how a calling convention is used to create function calls and interactions between different parts of a program. Um, and we saw that there are ways that the stack is manip manipulated to make that happen. Um, and how registers are manipulated to make that happen. Now I want to talk about operating systems and what that means for them. When we have a program running in user level, how do they interact with the operating system? Old style systems or some modern embedded systems, um, so old style systems like MS-DOS and new embedded operating systems, or I guess not new, but existing popular embedded operating systems like FreeRTOS, um, use a system a system structure, as we call it, how things are broken up in the system and how they communicate, which is to say they use no structure. Um, they essentially use those calling conventions that we just talked about to talk directly between applications to the operating system. The operating system in it is, in essence, just an extension of your program. They are, in many ways, no different. Um, so you might have an application calling directly to the device drivers of the system. You may have it calling to the resident system program, which in DOS terms was essentially the operating system, um, etc. So this is a very old way to think about the system and um, very simple. Everything is just kind of function calls created by the compiler. I want you to think a little bit about why that might be bad, why that might have downsides. Okay, um, restating that, why do we want to separate the operating system um, from user applications? We have multiple applications that want to run on a system. We have some operating system code that, as I said, provides abstractions to those applications and manages all of the resources on the system, which is to say it breaks up those resources and gives them to different applications. For instance, we have a fixed amount of physical memory um, on a, a actual system corresponding to how many DIMMs you have, how, much, how many gigabytes you have on the system. We need to split up that memory between all the applications. That is managing the resources between multiple applications. Why do we want to in some way separate the operating system from user applications? Again, think about this. If you can't think about it, at least look at this adorable pup who is thinking very difficult about this question as we speak. Um, the general answer is that we need protection. Two applications don't want to have to trust each other. If they don't trust each other, that means they need to be protected from the impacts of each other, from the effects of each other. If you are testing some application, right? We have this application that you're running on the system and you're testing your newly written C code, right? I know that you never make mistakes in C programs, but I make them all the time. And if you were running your flawless, obviously goes without saying, um, C program on the same 
hardware as mine, which is buggy as all hell and horrible and, you know, basically stomps all over all memory because I'm very bad at what I do. Um, then we have a problem if there's no protection, right? Because my application can stomp all over the memory of your application. My application can cause your application to fail. So we have two applications that don't trust each other and really want to be protected from the ill effects of each other, right? So this is why we need protection effectively. Um, and how we think about that is that the operating system needs to be protected from applications. Once the operating system is protected from the ill effects and perhaps maliciousness of applications, then the operating system can implement ways to separate the applications from each other. So one of the first big atoms that we're going to learn is called dual mode protection within hardware. The whole idea behind dual mode protection is simply that we want to be able to have hardware help us protect the kernel from the user, from user level applications. We separate the system into two modes, as we call them, user mode and kernel mode. Kernel mode is where the operating system lies, and user mode is where the user level applications are. And user mode and kernel mode, these are just names that effectively denote a single bit within the processor. You can quite literally think of a register, kind of a protected register, um, holding a bit which is zero if we're in the kernel, or one if we're in the user. So dual mode protection just basically says, hey, there's that bit devoted to saying whether we're in user mode and kernel mode. When we're in user mode, when that bit is set, we do not have access to all of the memory on the system. We'll talk about how memory is protected and um, your loads and stores can't be made on every single address later when we get to virtual address spaces. Um, but for now, take it as kind of a, a, a truth that user level applications cannot access the memory within the kernel. So all the memory is associated with one of those bits in some way too. So user level, when you're executing in user level, the mode bit is one. You cannot access any of the memory associated with mode bit zero. Cool, so now the kernel memory is in some way protected from user mode applications. But being in mode zero also gives us other special powers that I'll get into. Um, so as a, I just wanna summarize everything that I just said. Applications don't want to trust each other. That means we really want to protect applications from each other. To protect applications from each other, we want to protect the kernel from applications. So the kernel can implement policies to protect applications from each other, right? The kernel, you can think of as being synonymous with the operating system here, okay? It's a little more nuanced, and we'll go into some of that nuance later in the class, but for now, kernel equals operating system. Um, okay. The second thing is, okay, that's great. We have these mode bits, but like, how do we change the mode? If user level was able to just write to that register and change that mode bit on its own, then you're back to a system without protection because if the user level could essentially say, hey, look at me, I'm the kernel now, it doesn't really provide any protection of the kernel from that application. So we need some sort of a controlled way to switch back and forth between the user and the kernel in a way that the user cannot kind of um, hijack that mechanism and somehow take advantage of it to do kernel-like things, right? Um, so there are special instructions, ISA instructions for making what are called system calls and returning from system calls. System calls are just a instruction that allows an application to execute the instruction and that system call instruction switches to mode zero, starts executing at a fixed sy system call address within the kernel that the kernel actually set up and says, this is where I'm going to start ex uh, uh, executing system calls. Um, and then we have another instruction that the kernel can execute that returns back up to user level and can continue execution where it was at user level and sets the mode bit back to zero. Uh, 
So we have these two instructions that, in essence, don't just change the mode bit, but they also control where the next instructions we execute are. This allows the kernel to control when we enter mode 0, where we start executing in the kernel, so that it can define logic for doing that um, in a safe way. So in the picture, we see user level um, executing. It execute some sort of a call that make that executes the ISA instruction for making a system call that changes to mode zero starts executing at the defined system call address within the kernel and then we execute the system call return instruction to again revert mode bit back to one and return from the uh, to executing in user level um, yes so this is how we actually protect the kernel from the user now, modes actually mean slightly more than that. Modes, um, so as we said, mode zero equals kernel mode. That means, yes, that we can access kernel memory, but it means more than that. It also means that we can execute instructions that actually user level is not allowed to execute. So these are called protected or sensitive instructions. So ask yourself what instructions might be those that you'd be allowed to execute in the kernel, but not in user level. Stop and think for a little bit. What might some of those instructions be? Pause, blah, 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 all of that. Okay. Um, one of those instructions is kind of clearly to turn off the system, right? If you want to shut your system down, then really application should not be able to do that, right? Um, shutting the system down is something that kind of by definition interferes with and interrupts all executing user level processes, right? All of the applications on the system. So you only really want the kernel to define uh, the conditions under which you should be able to allowed to what's called halt the system. So there's a halt instruction. Um, what other instructions might there be? There are things like I.O. instructions. So if you want to talk to a device, there are specific ways that you do so. That's either defined in kernel memory or special instructions that only the kernel is able to execute to be able to talk to the devices of the system, right? So those are two examples. We'll talk about many, many different examples throughout the course of the class. Now, when you're in mode one, well, you can't execute any of those instructions. You can't access the kernel memory. So the kernel is isolated from the impacts of user memory. But there's a big question that I want you to think about. This is really hard, and this is what we're going to focus on for a little bit. It's the idea of we talked about CDECL as a calling convention for invoking functions within C programs, within general computations. Now we have system calls. How do you think we can start be executing a user level process and kind of at least abstractly call a function within the kernel? So there's a function um, called write. This is a system call provided by Unix type systems. Write allows you to write to something like the terminal or to a file, right? It allows you to change the contents of something, add to the contents of something. And if you want to call this write function, you need to make a system call to do it. Do we use the normal CDECL conventions for passing arguments to write on the stack, getting return values in a, a register? How do we actually do this? What is the mechanism for doing that? So let you think about that a little bit. And the thing that I really want you to focus on is what do we do with the stack? So do we just kind of add another invocation frame for the kernel onto the stack, or do we need to do something else? Think about it for a little bit, and then I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, system calls are actually a one example of a collection of means of trapping from user level to kernel level. And all of these have... Um, the complications that I was just kind of uh, uh, referring to about what stacks do we use and whatnot. I want to make sure. Yeah, okay. Um, actually, I do want to go over this here. Sorry for that slight jostling. 
Um, let me back up a little bit. Let me answer the question before we go on, then I'll reiterate it later. So what do we do with a register in the stack here? So the first thing that I want to point out is that we cannot do the same thing that we did when we were executing at user level, just invoking another function. If we want to push an invocation frame onto the stack and execute using that stack from the kernel, then that memory that the kernel is using to execute on that stack cannot be marked as kernel memory, right? If it were marked as kernel memory, as mode bit zero memory, then user level couldn't have been accessing it. Therefore, it couldn't have been doing its normal functions, uh, invocations, and all of that. So that memory used for the kernel invocation frame cannot both be protected while executing in the kernel, cannot be marked as mode zero, and something that user level can execute on. So we really do need to use a um, uh, do something else. And in general, what is done here is that we actually use a separate kernel stack to execute system calls on. So for every user level stack, we make a system call that traps into the system call handling code within the kernel. And one of the first jobs of the kernel is to get a stack within the kernel to execute on that corresponds to that user level stack. So it's a separate stack, but it exists within kernel memory. So now we have kind of given ourselves a stack to execute on um, while executing the system call. Now, how do we get the arguments um, from that user level stack and kind of transfer them down onto the kernel stack so that we can then invoke a kernel function, which is C code. So it needs to use C decal. So abstractly, what we're trying to do here is transform between C decal calls in user level to a system call that switches between stacks back to C decal calls that are made within the kernel. So you will go through a lot of code for this, and in labs you'll go through code for this, um, essentially to see what that looks like and how XV6 does it. Long story short, it does involve copying portions of the stack in user level down onto the kernel mode stack to emulate C decal style um, uh, function calls in the kernel. Now system calls are one example of kind of these switches from mode um, one to mode zero, from user mode to kernel mode. But there are other examples. So interrupts, exceptions, and traps. These are all words for essentially different mechanisms for this. Trap is kind of a different word for a system call. Um, these are all software triggered events. Uh, not, I'm sorry, not all of them are. Some of these are software triggered events. So exceptions and system calls, for instance, are software triggered events. What that means is that software's actions while it was executing its instruction stream caused the switch down to mode zero. So system calls are a trivial example of this. User mode executed the system call instruction to be able to switch down to the kernel. Therefore, it's a software triggered event, right? Um, exceptions are a fault. They are a problem encountered by the architecture when executing something for the instruction. So the CPU is essentially saying, I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. I'm going to yell to the kernel saying, user level's being bad. Go throw them into their room and try to fix up their state or do something with them, right? So when you execute divide by zero, Divide by zero is something that, you know, it's kind of hard to define what it means mathematically. So a CPU obviously has no idea. So when you try to divide by zero, that actually causes an exception, which traps to mode zero and starts executing an exception handler within the kernel that is there to decide what should be done when an application divides by zero. Other examples of these are things like general protection faults or segmentation faults. When you're executing your C program and it yells back at you segmentation fault, I know this doesn't happen to you, but for those of us who make tons of errors when we write C code, we see segmentation code a lot, just take my word for it. Um, these are all just exceptions that trigger execution within the kernel. And the kernel says, oh, wow, that's bad. And then it does something in response to that fault. Um, in many cases, it will essentially terminate the user level application. So when you see a segmentation fault and that stops your program's execution, that's the kernel 
getting an exception and then killing your application, right? Um, <clears throat> if you try to access the null pointer, um, that's basically another example like divide by zero of something the processor doesn't know how to do. Null is a pointer to nothing by default. Um, it's actually a pointer to address zero in most systems. Um, so that is something that the processor doesn't know how to deal with. So that causes an exception that the kernel has to uh, remediate in some way. So these are not necessarily requested by the executing application. They're not like a system call where there's an instruction that they execute for that. But it is in response to the actions of the user level instruction flow, right? So that's why we call these software triggered events. Um, traps or software interrupts, these are system calls and things like that. So the instruction for executing a system call on 32-bit x86 is either sysinter, um, trap from the user into the system, into the kernel, um, or int, which stands for interrupt, which is very confusing on x86, um, which is what xv6 uses. Interrupts are a way to kind of stop the process executing and they're in response to device um, state changes, and we'll talk about those in the next lecture. I'm not going to talk about them now. Okay, so let's back up. System calls, I want to, you know, forest from the trees here, right? Forest from the trees, system calls are a piece of hardware support for essentially just making a function call to something in the kernel. Let's back up and reiterate what we're doing here, right? We're adding a lot of complexity, multiple modes, system calls for switching between modes, all the inefficiencies and complexities of having user stacks and kernel stacks and switching between them on, fun on system calls, all of that. Again, remember, why can't you just make a call directly from user level down to the kernel? Ask yourself this and come back. Um, I just want to remind you, you know, we're doing this because we need protection. We need to have mode one applications not able to impact the state of the kernel, yet be able to invoke functions in the kernel so that the kernel can provide it abstractions and manage its resources. So we need to provide a way for them to interact, but we don't want the kernel to have to trust applications, right? So that's the core of what we're trying to do here. And we need to switch modes to be able to maintain that isolation of the kernel from the application. And that switching of modes requires the ISA instructions for system calls and then the return from a system call. And that's why we're doing everything that we're doing. Okay, so let's look at how this kind of composes with application logic. On the top left, we call printf, right? You do this all the time in C, printf takes a string and you're basically saying to print it out to the uh, terminal, right? That actually does not invoke the kernel, that invokes the libc, the C library, right? A library is just a big collection of code that actually kind of gets um, combined with your code, linked with your code to produce the binary that you're running, right? So ls includes the code for ls, but also all of the C library stuff um, that we're seeing here. So printf is a C library function, just like malloc and free. And in their logic, they end up calling the write system call. Write writes to a certain resource, writes to a what's called a file descriptor. And in this case, it writes to file descriptor one. File descriptor one happens to correspond to the standard output. That's your terminal. Um, we'll talk about a lot of these things in lab. I'm not gonna go into details now. So what write does is it says, okay, I need to do a, two, a few things. I want to call the kernel and ask it to do this write system call for me. But one, I need to tell the kernel which system call I'm trying to make, in this case, write. So what operating systems typically do is they just enumerate all of the system calls. It just so happens that the write system call often has the number four. So if you want to make the fourth system call, you're effectively try asking for a write system call, okay? So first, what the write implementation does is somehow it puts into a register the value four. So that register, often EAX, on the 32-bit x86 system, um, stores four. It's saying, 
um, I want to make the fourth system call. The assumption is that the kernel is going to look at the contents of that register to decide which system call to make. Okay. Then we want to pass two arguments. The first argument is the file descriptor that that write call is being made on. So one way to do that might be that we put that file descriptor into another register and pass um, it down to the kernel via that register. Another is that we leave it on the stack and we expect the kernel to access it on the stack. And that's what XV6 does. Um, it also points out, pushes onto the stack the um, address of the print me string, um, right? So again, that could be put into registers. It could be placed onto the stack. Depends on the system. Um, Linux puts it into registers. XV6 puts it onto the stack. Then we make the um, ISA instruction sysinner or int, depending on the system. Sysinner is much faster. Int is what x86 uses. This. Sets the mode bit to zero, so switches to kernel mode, switches to the kernel stack within the kernel, and starts executing at a kernel-defined system call instruction, right? So we start executing the system call handler within the kernel. The first thing that that system call handler might do is look up in just a table that ha has a number of indices based on how many system calls there are and just looks up that file, that um, uh, system call that we're trying to perform. So in this case, we're looking up the fourth system call, right? So it looks up that fourth item in the system call table and invokes that function. So calls right. So we've gotten a kernel stack. We've called the fourth system call, i.e. write, and then the contents of that write system call essentially need to somehow retrieve the arguments for the file descriptor and the print me address of the string and have the logic for printing that out onto the terminal. After we execute that logic, we're going to want to return perhaps how many bytes were written. Um, which is what write typically returns. And we want to return to where we were executing in user level. So the sys exit or iret instructions are those that return from a system call and those effectively restore all the application registers, which has the impact of returning back to user level and um, starting to execute the address after the system call. So this is effectively what a system call looks like. Um, to go into even more gory details, you will want to look back at this slide when you're, ex when you're doing homework three. Um, just FYI, um, that'll save you a lot of time. Um, this is effectively a map for how system calls are made in XV6. So we have our application and it executes right. We see this on the right, the top left box. So it's trying to call right on the one file descriptor, again, the standard output to the terminal. It's trying to um, print out the OS string and it's saying that that string has three values in it. Remember the um, string terminating value, the backslash zero. So there are three characters there. This effectively invokes, so write is implemented at user level in a library that is implemented in assembly. And we see that in uses.s, where we see the implementation of write that effectively moves um, 16 into the A register and then makes the syscall instruction called int, okay? So that traps down to user level, that int um, ISA instruction traps to kernel level, which switches to the kernel stack and starts executing at mode zero. And it starts executing, XV6 has programmed it to start executing at the all traps um, address, the all traps handler, which is in trap asm.s, also assembly. Um, trust me, there's not that much assembly in this class, but these first couple of weeks, there is some. Um, the first things it does is execute an instruction for pushing all of the all of the registers onto the stack, push al, and um, it will push a pointer to the registers onto the stack. Um, I am not going to go into what that's doing here or what that's doing yet. Um, and then it calls the trap function. So the trap is a system call handler in C. So this trap ASM, the all traps function, its job is effectively just to kind of try to 
get rid of execution and assembly and go up to C. So what we're doing is the push L for ESP is pushing a pointer to all of those saved registers on the stack. We start executing trap where we see that argument that got passed in. I don't need you to understand absolutely everything having to do with that. You will by the third homework. The third homework involves a lot of this type of stuff. Um, that would be the third lab as well. Um, and what happens here is that we're able to effectively decide whether we're in a system call, figure out which system call to make, which is done by the system call function in system call.c, which then executes which specific system call we're making um, by invoking it within that array of function pointers, one per system call. So what I do want you to see is on the bottom right, you have the EAX register, which is being used to um, index into the syscall's array of function pointers and invoke that function. So this is weird C syntax, right? The syscall's uh, variable is an array. We're indexing um, into that array by the value that was in EAX, and then we're invoking what is in that syscall array at that value um, as a function. Okay, so that's what's happening there. But what I want you to focus on here is that we're just invoking the function corresponding to what was in EAX. If we look on the far left of the slide, again, we see that the value 16 is being pushed into EAX. Well, that's effectively what I'm saying is the right system call corresponds to the 16th system call, and we're actually making that system call here. Sorry, Penny is trying to contribute. She does not like system calls. She's just getting furious right now. Okay, we've covered a lot of grounds. We've said, um, how do normal functions coordinate within a system? We do that by calling conventions implemented with by the compiler that orchestrate effectively how we manage the stack and registers for passing arguments, for managing local values, and for returning arguments. And because the operating systems have to deal with multiple untrusting clients and trusting applications, we see that we need a kernel to be isolated from those applications, which requires dual mode execution. And that defines a new mode that we have not seen before in our um, computer science career called kernel mode, where all of our OS code is executed. That kernel mode code is isolated and the memory is isolated from applications. They cannot access the kernel mode code. And we use system calls instead of function calls to effectively switch between user level and kernel level and invoke the functions within the kernel. And we've seen one example of control flow in XV6, the operating system that we're using in the system, for actually driving a lot of that execution. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Please don't forget to fill out the form, and I look forward to seeing you in class and diving into your questions and confusions about this. Don't hold back. If you're confused about anything, we're going over it in class for a reason. Ask what you think might be dumb questions. Ask anything. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Bye.